Welcome to today's episode of Everyday Alex and today's Wellness Wednesday. And this week we have the second in a three part series exploring digestion with Sana Anderson from the nutrition team at the Optimum Health Clinic. If you haven't already checked out last week's episode, we talked about why digestion and gut health is so important. In this week's episode, we're going to be talking about some of the basic diet principles. I think it can be overwhelmingly confusing what people should be eating and shouldn't be eating. And so, of course, this is not a comprehensive video going into all the details, but we explore some of the key fundamentals in a way which I think is, is hopefully quite helpful. And then in next week's episode, we're going to go into some of the testing that we do, particularly looking at small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or otherwise known as SIBO. So here's Sana, and um, yeah, I hope you find this helpful. I think that it's really important when it comes to digestion to not go into a point of view of having to do everything perfectly. We've all got to start somewhere, but I hope you find this helpful. So welcome, Sana, to this video. Hi. So in this video, we're exploring, is there a best diet for digestive health in chronic fatigue syndrome? So that's the, that's the million dollar question, Sana. Is, <laughs> yes. there, is there a best diet? Um, and yes, your million dollar answer is no, there isn't. <laughs> um, I think um, it's, it's very dependent on the individual circumstances. And it's quite dependent on where that individual is within their journey. A diet that's appropriate for them right now, maybe, you know, will look somewhat different when they are further in their journey or, or at times might look stricter if we're you know, addressing a particular issue and, and trying to sort of create changes and so on. Um, but of course, there are um, foods that we can look at at a slightly more sort of general level um, because we understand that they can be um, they can be hard work um, for the digestive system. Um, I think the two major ones that we tend to look at are gluten and dairy. Um, now I know maybe gluten free has has become a bit of a bit of a trendy thing and there are people who are for it and against it. I think what you have to do is look behind all the all the hype and look at some of the research that's coming out um, nowadays. Um, so with gluten particularly, what's really interesting is its effect on on the lining of our digestive system. So we talk about the sort of intestinal lining or epithelial lining. It's basically the wall of cells that line line the digestive system, um, and those cells are sort of bound together tightly and that keeps the integrity of the gut lining. Um, there's a protein called zonulin. I sort of imagine it a little bit like um, laces in your shoes. Uh, so when the laces are tight, um, the cell junctions are tight and therefore you know, the lining is healthy, absorption happens as it should and so on. Um, what the research has shown, without making this too complicated, is that gluten can lead to um, changes in how zonulin uh, works, and it can basically um, increase permeability. So those sort of tight junctions uh, between the cells can become looser, um, which means sort of the old-fashioned way of describing it often has been leaky gut. Um, or nowadays we call it increased intestinal permeability. Um, basically, it's almost, you know, slightly damaging um, the intestinal lining and therefore altering the way that we absorb foods and, um, you know, can cause sort of immune system reactivity um, because we may be absorbing slightly larger particles that our bodies don't, don't recognise as something that's, that's kind of OK and safe. So um, kind of the long story short, um, trialing gluten free diet um, to often to sort of calm um, the digestive environment down and to support healthy um, intestinal lining can be a very helpful way to um, sort of start um, some of the digestive, um, some of the sort of dietary changes that we might 
want to make to begin with. Yeah, because, you know, as much as we're saying there isn't a best diet, there are sort of key checklists and principles of things that we know are often problematic that we can sort of experiment to see if that is the case for any particular individual. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that can be helpful with gluten is, is, is almost as simple as, well, what happens if you don't eat any gluten for, yeah. would you say like a, a week or two weeks? Or it can be up to two or three months, I think, can't it? Yes. I mean, it... <laughs> Again, yeah, it is very individual. Some people, some people notice a difference very quickly, which, of course, in you know, in terms of compliance, is great uh, because if you feel better, you know, I have had clients who just literally their pain levels have dramatically gone down within a week or two of of eliminating gluten. Others, there may be other things going on as well. You know, it's rarely a sort of very simple well x equals y. If we take gluten out, then then everything will be well. Uh, there may well be other sort of bacterial imbalances all sorts of other things still disrupting the digestive system but i'd give it at least sort of well three to four weeks ideally um and for others i have to say also not to sort of lose heart with that because some people they don't necessarily notice the difference when they're off gluten but then when they either intentionally or accidentally expose themselves um, to gluten again that suddenly when the penny drops you suddenly realize oh my goodness you know the bloating that i had experienced actually i hadn't realized that it had gone and now it's back with with the gusto or or you know my pain levels had gone down or my, my brain fog actually had shifted a little bit um so those sorts of things can help um and for others as well i i certainly just want to kind of make it very clear that we are not advocating all of our clients to be 100% gluten free. Um, however, it is a sort of a nutrient that, you know, if you think of the foods that come with gluten, like bread and biscuits and pasta and so on, um, they don't tend to, they're not the most kind of micronutrient dense foods. So by reducing gluten in your diet, um, you're certainly not missing out on, on highly nutritious foods. Um, and they in make fact, mostly quite filling foods, right? So they fill yes, you it up. Can, yeah, sort of, yeah, it's sort of, I'd often call empty calories. So if, I don't know, at very simple level, if you take your sort of normal wheat-based spaghetti and you replace it with, I don't know, spiralized gougette, then you're actually getting, you know, much more vitamins and minerals um, in your food um, and, you know, for the similar amount of, amount of calories um just moving a bit sort of um along in terms of the digestive process as well so there's the sort of there's the food that we eat and there's obviously that's a much much bigger topic but i think gluten is a good way of sort of highlighting the principles it's also i guess looking at some of the the ability the body actually has to digest that so maybe say a little yeah. bit about why that's important yeah absolutely so i think we earlier sort of touched upon the fact that long-term stress um, can suppress digestive function. So again, when we start um, sort of working on the diet, making it work for that individual, um, it's not necessarily just about um, the actual foods in the diet, but we're also looking at how to make it perhaps more easy to digest to begin with. So we might want to, of course, um, sort of supplement with digestive enzymes, uh, but also look at maybe how how you cook and process the foods. So initially for someone whose digestive system is perhaps suppressed and um, who has been struggling to digest and absorb. Um, again, I, I think a lot of, lot of people, when we talk about sort of optimal diet, we think a lot about sort of fresh, uncooked foods you know raw vegetables and so on because when you cook them you lose some of the nutrients and so on actually to begin with it might be much more sensible to to steam your vegetables use soups pureed soups um you know, make vegetable soups make smoothies with vegetables berries and so on so that you you keep the delivery easy and um so again yeah it's not just about the actual food items but it's how how you deliver them and then again moving a bit further down in a sense i guess the digestive process um yeah. maybe just touch on again um 
uh, beneficial bacteria and the kind of microbiome element. Because again, it's sort of tracking it back to the, this, this kind of focus of this video. People get very fixated on what should I be eating, but actually it's not just the food that someone's eating, as you're saying, it's, it's the ability to break it down in the, with digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid and those sorts of things. But then it's also the, the further breakdown with the microbiome. Yeah. And so in some ways it's, you know, what and who are you feeding with that food? You are not just feeding sort of your cells, um, but you do need to think about how you are feeding that microbiome, um, which is an important part of your of your digestive system and of your immune system as well. So uh, the bacteria that resides in your large intestine, they need certain types of carbohydrates, certain types of fibers in your diet. Um, there are specific foods that um, can be very beneficial. Um, a lot of the uh, sort of fermented foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, um, although again, uh, with caution, there are some people who have perhaps some um, more persistent um, ongoing issues with their di digestive function may not be to able to tolerate those foods to begin with. But you know, again, that might be then a good good sort of indicator that we'll need to delve delve deep deeper and, and perhaps do some testing. Yeah, it's also, I'm just thinking as we sort of go from, down the digestive process, also there's a step right at the start in terms of just sort of how someone kind of chews the environment they're in. And so maybe just let's just touch on that as well, which we'll yeah. sort, of, we sort of go back know, to the start I, I think of that it, process. Yeah, because I think, um, yeah, as, as we've already said, it's it's sort of not not just what you've got on your plate, but you know how it's it's delivered to you. And yes, of course, we can use we can use digestive enzymes. We can supplement with hydrochloric acid as well. But I do think we all kind of have a responsibility to to respect that digestive process as well. You know, we should have all the um, tools kind of within our bodies to to do it properly. So kind of remember to chew. Um, I think somebody I heard had said to their kid, you know, there's there's no teeth in your stomach, so you have to do that work um, in your mouth. And by the chewing action, you're already starting to uh, produce uh, some digestive enzymes, particularly amylase, which helps uh, break down carbohydrates. Some of that is already taking place in your mouth. Um, so you know, the, the usual kind of slowing down, actually sitting down to eat. Don't necessarily sort of try to hoover the food up whilst you're doing something else, as, as a lot of us do try to multitask. So make time for food, slow down the pace of the meal, sort of try to enjoy every mouthful that you are eating. Um, and actually beyond the actual meal times as well, sort of respect those meal times don't necessarily snack um, or graze in between meals because you need to allow your digestive system to do its job and some of that job is already all also basically done um, during those gaps between the meals yeah i think it's it's making sure there's a good sort of is it three to four hours so if someone's sometimes a gap between lunch at one o'clock and dinner at eight, nine o'clock might be too long a gap without a snack, yeah. but it's not the kind of constant grazing and constantly making the digestive system kind of go into action. It's giving it that time to sort of rest and digest as well. Yeah. And of course, again, we have to look at each individual situation. Um, there are people whose digestive systems may be struggling so much that we need to keep the meal sort of portion sizes quite small to not overwhelm the digestive system. And that means that you probably do have to eat a little bit more frequently to keep, keep yourself fueled up and to achieve the, the sort of right amount of calories for the day. Uh, but yeah, in the long run, we are aiming for those sort of in, you know, in generic terms, healthier gaps between meals, which are even sort of three to three to five hours. Yeah. Great. I just think in terms of, of summarizing what we've been talking about in this video, it's almost seeing it step by step. It's not just the food that someone eats. It's the chewing of that food. It's the breaking down of that food with digestive enzymes or hydro, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Yeah. It's then the using the gun kind of bacteria in the small and primarily the large intestine to actually then break and absorb that, break it down and absorb that. And I think it's people remembering that 
the food you eat is important, but this, all the different steps of this process are also, you know, in, in many ways as important, if not at times even more important. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Sana. I think that was a really helpful sort of bit of a, almost like a whistle stop tour of the digestive <laughs> process. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Wellness Wednesday. Do look out for next week's episode. We're going to be talking about some of the testing we can do, particularly looking at SIBO, otherwise known as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If you'd like to work with Sana or one of the nutrition team at the Optimum Health Clinic, the best way to find out more is to go to theoptimumhealthclinic.com. You can request a free information pack. You can also book a free 15 minute chat with um, Sana or one of the other nutrition practitioners. It's the best way to find out if our approach will be helpful and hopefully effective for you. And fingers crossed, hopefully, I'm gonna be back in the studio in London tomorrow to start filming some more episodes. It's been, I guess it's probably been almost three months, two and a half months since we last filmed that. So I'm looking forward to getting back in there. And I think part of the plan for the coming days and weeks is to start to share some of the highlights from the upcoming Trauma and Mind Body Super Conference. If you haven't already registered, check out Monday's episode of Everyday Alex, where I talked about the conference, some of what's involved. You can also get the link to be able to register for free, including some awesome registration gifts available right now. So I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you for watching and look forward to talking with you again soon.